All right, well, this morning uh, we have a special guest speaker with us, and guest speaker in that he is a guest to uh, this stage. It's the first time to speak, uh, but uh, absolutely one of our own. Uh, Justin Braun has been with us for about a year. And uh, just an incredible young man that we've been so grateful that's been a part of our body. And he wasted no time just getting plugged in around here uh, when he showed up about a year ago. And he's been helping to lead our uh, post-college young adult missional community and ministry. And uh, it's a ministry that we have seen just really take off and see some great momentum and continue to grow. So we're grateful for the ways that uh, he has poured into that group. Uh, Justin works in the orthopedic world, but he has um, heard the Lord's call to full-time ministry. And so he's in the process of getting ready to go to seminary uh, at Dallas Theological Seminary in August. And uh, while we are so, so sad to lose him, uh, we are definitely excited to launch him into what God uh, has in store for him. And uh, one of his passions is just opening God's word and teaching. So we are just thrilled uh, to give him that opportunity here this morning. But it is a nerve-wracking thing to come up and stand in front of you guys, especially for the first time. So could you please help me in just giving him an unbelievably warm welcome and welcome Justin Braun this morning. All right. Good morning, Mission Point Church. It is just fantastic to be here with you all. Um, Like Matt said, uh, I've been here for about a year, and I I just want to point out, um, and I'm sure all of you would agree with me, that Mission Point Church has been such an impact on my life, and this last year has just been something amazing. And I'm thankful, so thankful um, for everyone here, the congregation, and the staff here at Mission Point Church. Um, before I get started, I wanted to um, reach out to a certain group of people that I know have already had a pretty rough morning. Um, all of you people who, uh, I'm so sorry that you had to sleep in this morning. You, you know, you're usually here at 9 a.m. I am so sorry. That must have been so rough on you guys. But I, I, I hope that you can still track with me and that we're going to have a good time this morning. Um, a few weeks ago, Matt, uh, he revealed to us his true belief on, on his presence here on stage, is that when he gets on stage, um, he's actually the secret weapon uh, to Kondo. Um, and so I was thinking about this, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. If, if, if Matt is the secret weapon to Kondo, and Matt just introduced me, that must make me the guy who doesn't have to get paid on this holiday weekend. Um, uh, would you guys pray with me before we get started? God, I just want to thank you so much um, for who you are, um, for your wonderful name, and for resurrecting us unto yourself. God, I just pray that as we continue on this morning, that you'd be able to speak through your word, and that uh, at the end of today, we would be able to come out um, closer to you, uh, and just knowing you um, even more. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. When I was younger, uh, my parents, so a lot of you are thinking, younger, man, you, got, you look like you're 16. Um, <laughs> When I was younger, believe it or not, uh, when I was in eighth grade approximately, my parents, they said, you know what, guys, we're gonna, we want to change things up. We're going to finish our basement. Now, my siblings and I, we were, we were thrilled at the news of that. Um, I mean, only good things can come from a finished basement, right? And, uh, well, one Friday evening, as the process is going and the work is concluding, um, the, dro- the drop ceiling had been put in, the drywall was up, um, our parents, my parents came to my twin brother and I like, hey, we would really, we're going to be gone tomorrow morning. Um, we would really like for you to get up there uh, and early in the morning and just mop, mop the concrete floor of the basement for us. Well, my brother and I, we obviously responded with grumbling at first, and we weren't necessarily the happiest about it. But when we realized that there was no getting out of it, we, uh, we, we, we became more excited about it. We saw this as a good role for us to play in the job um, in the project of finishing our basement. And we got, we got excited. And uh, we saw this as an opportunity that we, we, it was an easy job. It wasn't going to take long. And the results were going to be definite. I mean, when you're, when you're mopping up all the drywall dust from the floor, there's a clear result. So we actually, you know, we were going to take this as a challenge. We were competitive. We were going to get up early the next morning and do that. Well, so we did. We got up that morning, 
And we went down, and we didn't even look at the floor. We just, we got the mops, and we just went to town. And, you know, we, we did it for a little bit, and all of a sudden, we start to realize we are not seeing any results from anything. And we'd been doing this for half hour, hour, and we were, we were just not seeing anything. Um, and eventually, what happened was uh, our enthusiasm started to die down. Um, we were starting to get hungry, and we, you know what, we eventually just quit. The significance that we thought we would have and the results that we wanted to see were no longer there. We, we weren't seeing that, and so we just quit. Um, well, later that afternoon, our parents got home, and uh, we started talking to them about it, and they just look at us, and they're like, you went down there and you mopped that floor? We're like, yeah, you asked us to. And they're like, ah. Guys, we, we, we wanted to surprise you. We actually cleaned the floor last night, and we were thinking that you would have just noticed that you were mopping a clean floor. And so obviously they, they got quite the kick out of that. It was super humbling for my brother and I. And, uh, and I, I know you guys are judging us. You're thinking, you're thinking, it was a clean floor. How did you not notice you were mopping a clean floor? Well, my parents asked us the same thing, and to this day I have no idea how we did not notice that was a clean floor. But before you guys judge me too quick, I, as I was preparing for this message, I realized, like, isn't that such a great example of, of the temptation that we as Christians um, tend to want to live our lives? We forget that the work has already been done for us. You know, the songs we just sang, what a wonderful name, and, and resurrected. Christ has already done all of the work for us. It's done. And if, we, and if we say that we have a relationship with Christ, and if we are believing in his name, then all of a sudden, that floor is already clean. And how often, how often do we as Christians approach the floor without even looking? And we tend to rely on ourselves. We set these rules and we set these standards. We try to find significance in certain ways that we live our life. We, 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 we want to live these put-together Christian lives. We come here on Sunday morning, we put a smile on, and all of a sudden it becomes this comparison game. Who's living the most spiritual life? Who's living the most Christian walk? But what if it wasn't about this? What if it wasn't even about living the most put-together Christian life? What if it wasn't about the rules or the standards that we place on ourselves to make sure that we're doing the right thing at the right time, at the right moment, trying not to be that socially awkward Christian who doesn't have everything figured out but just wants to be accepted? What if it wasn't about that at all? And it was about one thing, just one thing. I want to challenge us to think about one thing that we're supposed to be concentrating on, the one thing that if when we can truly grasp it, and truly concentrate on what it means, then everything else follows behind it. The one thing that literally would transform the way we sleep, the way we talk, the way we act, everything about our lives is transformed with it. And what if that one thing was rest? Now some of you 9 a.m.ers, you're thinking, oh man, he's going to tell us we have to sleep in every week from here on out. Um, no, not at all. If, uh, if you would turn with me to Hebrews um, chapter 4, we have the scripture up on, up on the screen, but Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, I believe this is going to give us a good example of, of what it means in God's promise to us who, who, who say that we are in a relationship with him. Now Hebrews, just a quick background, Hebrews was written to a group of Jewish converts um, back, back in the first century. Of, and these, these, these Jewish converts were familiar with Judaism. They were familiar with the Old Testament law. They were all about um, working. They were all about doing the works and, and coming out on top. That's the way they, they received their righteousness. And they were being tempted to not see Jesus as the ultimate Sacrifice, the ultimate fulfillment. They want to continue and even revert back to Judaism and bring certain aspects of the law back into Christianity and continue to perform some of the uh, law. And here the author writes to them in verse 9 and 10, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. 
Now, as 21st century Christians, for me at least, what does this look like? I mean, this was written to Jewish converts of the first century who were familiar with Old Testament law. I'm not familiar with Old Testament law. I'm, I'm not a Jewish convert. So what does that look like for us as 21st century Christians? Well, I honestly believe that there are so many fantastic promises in the Word of God, and I believe this is one of them. And I think that there are so many examples of what this looks like and how we can apply this to our own lives today. Um, so we're going to be jumping back and forth all throughout Scripture. So I, I, I beg you to just track with me. We're going to be jumping back to Psalm 23 now. Um, if you want to find Psalm 23, we're going to jump there for the time being. We're going to kind of stick here on trying to figure out what does it mean to rest? Rest in God. What does it mean to enter God's rest? Now, Psalm 23 was written by King David. King David was considered a man after God's own heart. Now, who else would be a better example of someone who have, who's experiencing God's rest than King David himself? And, I, and with this psalm, I honestly believe that this is such a great example of what it means to find rest in God. So Psalm 23, the very first verse, um, it says, the Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, if, if Kondo were here, he would stop. What? He's not here, so I can do that. Um, <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. You know, as I read Psalm 23, I tend to skip over this part so many times. I want to get to the good stuff. As we continue on, we're going to continue on in a few moments. But I skip over, the Lord is my shepherd. What does this mean? If, if King David is writing, the Lord is my shepherd, well, what does a shepherd do? He tends to the flock, tends to the sheep. So if the Lord is King David's shepherd, King David is quite literally saying, I am a sheep. Now, I and mean, that's where the whole condo, like, what? No, I don't want to be a sheep. There's nothing attractive about being a sheep. Uh, when I think of a sheep, I, I mean, I think of, you know, really just not the smartest or the most attractive or the most exciting animals. But that is what King David is saying right here. In the very first part, as he opens up with this psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, let's continue on with the, with the first few verses of Psalm 23 here. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now we're getting to the good stuff. Here we find out what it truly means to be a sheep. Here we truly find out what it looks like to, to find rest in our shepherd and what it truly means to trust and to give up ourselves. So what is the first thing we read? He makes me lie down in green pastures. The Lord, the shepherd, the shepherd is our provider. All of a sudden, we see that when we decide to give up ourselves, to give up our own works, to give up um, anything that we're trying to find our own significance through, we see the shepherd as our provider. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. That's the first thing. The shepherd is our provider. The second thing we read, he guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. The shepherd is our significance. When we decide to lay down ourselves and when we decide that all of a sudden we want to experience true rest in God, we see that he, the shepherd is our provider and the shepherd is our significance. As a sheep, so what, 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 what do sheep do? That's a good question. I, I really have no idea what sheep do other than, than eat and follow and sleep and what have you. But when we, when we decide as Christians to become sheep, we all of a sudden are putting all of our trust and all of our hope into the shepherd. Anything that we want, anything, any direction that we feel like the, that God might be calling us to, any significance, 
our works, our actions, instead of putting all of these rules and standards in our life to fix our own mistakes, instead of trying to work our own lives to see the results, all of a sudden everything is backed up by knowing that the Lord is our shepherd. He's our provider. He's going to get us where we need to be, when we need to be there, with whom we need to be there with. In this case, there's a whole bunch of other sheep. But how magnificent is it that we are surrounded by all these other sheep? Because when it comes to the flock of Christ, it's no longer about comparison. We all share the same white coat of fleece. Isn't that fantastic? It's no longer about who can live the most put-together Christian life, but rather we're sharing all in the same thing. Now, now does this mean that when we, when we become sheep that no longer are we going to experience pain or hard times or troubles? No. In fact, if we continue on um, with the rest of Psalm 23, David goes on to say, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Even King David recognizes that even though the Lord is his shepherd and he is the sheep, even though he's put everything into God's hands, he's still going to experience those tough times. You know, King David, before, before he became king, was actually a shepherd. This is probably why this resonates so well with him. And before he fought Goliath, he goes and he, he tells us in 1 Samuel that he fought lions, he fought bears for the protection of his sheep. Did he keep the bears and the lions from approaching or from coming? No. But he was there to fend them off. Now, as sheep, as sheep, we get to have this amazing promise that they automatically trust that the shepherd is going to be there for them. When the wild animals and the tough times and the, and the troubles come upon us, they know that the shepherd is there with them. And he's going to protect them. You see, all of a sudden, they get to rest in the relationship that they have with the shepherd. And it's the same thing with us. Isn't that so fantastic? It's the same thing with us, that as God's sheep, we get to rest in the relationship that we have with him. No longer do we have to try to find our significance in the lives that we live. No longer do we have to put all these rules and standards and try to do all of these things to get these clear results, because guess what, guys? It's already a clean floor. We've already been protected, and we already have that white coat. And what's more, what's so fantastic about all of this is that it is a relationship. You know, as sheep, they get to know the voice of their shepherd. They become used to his presence. They get used to his rod and his staff. They know when he's around. Because the great thing is, you know, we read the Lord, I mean, he's our shepherd, yeah. He's our shepherd. He's shepherding the church, and eventually one day we're going to spend eternity with him. But the Lord is also my shepherd. He's your shepherd. It's a personal relationship. Each and every one of you, me, everyone included, the sheep, each individual sheep gets to know the relationship and the presence of their shepherd. So what does this look like? What does it look like to have this relationship with a shepherd? How do we get to know him? You know, we read that King David says, the Lord is my shepherd, but, you know, how, how applicable is that to us now? Well, okay, let's go. Going back to Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter 4, again, we're going to continue on. Verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So how do we get to know our shepherd? 
how do we get to continue diving deep into the relationship that we have with God? Well, I think this is a great example right here in Hebrews. Not only do we see the active word of God, but the author of Hebrews is also showing us the activity of God. See, it goes hand in hand. It's simultaneous. When we know the word of God, we know God. This is his letter to us as the church. This is his love letter to me and to you. And when we dive deep into the word, we see the activity of God. We see what he's like. We see his mercy and his compassion. We see his anger. It's all on this personal level. And we get to know when our shepherd is around. We get to know when we get, we get used to hearing our shepherd's voice by diving deep into the word of God. And when we get to know the word of God, we understand some promises that he gives us. You know, we read in Psalm 23 all of these great things. You know, he leads me to beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He leads me down paths of righteousness. Green pastures. That's fantastic. But there's more to it. When we dive deep into the word, we see these promises of God on a whole new level. This, ent- this entire book is filled with knowledge of God, and it's, it's God talking to us and saying, I want to get to know you, and this is how you get to know me. I, have, I, I went ahead and selected a few verses that I think are so, so key to our relationship with Christ. The promises that were offered as his sheep. The first one is Philippians 4, 6-7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is just one promise of so many that we see through the word of God. When we dive deep into the relationship that he wants to have with us, this is what we find in there. When we give everything over to him, in times of anxiousness, in times of turmoil, by prayer and petition, the peace of God which transcends all understanding. I can relate to that. As I was sitting right down here, you can better believe it, I was anxious. I was nervous. But there's a peace of God knowing that when he is with you, everything's going to be okay. And he's going to take you exactly where he wants you when he wants you there, with whom he wants you to be with. The second one is in John 1. John 1, 12 through 13. One of my favorite pieces of scripture. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will but born of God. Man, doesn't that excite you? Children of God. We are children of God. Isn't that one of the most fantastic things you can ever get to know? When, When all of a sudden, we decide that we no longer want to rely on our own works, on our own significance, we realize that God is our dad and he wants to have a relationship with us. The God of the universe who created all the stars and the heavens, the deepest part of the oceans, wants to know me personally. And he wants, me to, he wants to take me to the depths of... I can't even fathom. And man, I tell you what, that excites me. For the last year, I've been working for an orthopedic company, um, and it's, it's it's been a great year. It's been a great year. But like Matt said, I've had this calling, I felt this calling of of being called to vocational ministry. And it's a scary thing, leaving a safe job where there is security. Um, I'm getting married in November, and I could easily stay here and, and, and save money. And, and raise a family. But right now, the peace that transcends all understanding, I'm experiencing that. 
And it's fantastic because I know that by following the calling of God that he is with me. And he's going to lead me to those still waters and I'm going to lay down in those green pastures and he's going to continue time after time to restore my soul. And even though I walk through tough times, I'm going to be broke here in the next couple months. Those are my tough times. But my God is with me. My father, my daddy, my Abba Father is with me. And he's going to continue to provide during that time. Finally, lastly, before we conclude, isn't this great? Kondo's not teaching and it's not a 40-minute sermon. I can get you guys out for lunch. <laughs> yeah, there we go. We got some happy people in the house today. All right. Hebrews chapter 12. This is one of my all-time favorite pieces of scripture. Now, in Hebrews 11, we read, you know, to, to forecast this particular verse, Hebrews chapter 11, we read about men and women all throughout the Bible who found rest in their relationship with God. And I tell you what, if you go ahead and read chapter 11, I would encourage you to read chapter 11. It tells of these amazing men and women who went through incredibly tough situations, incredibly tough times. King David's mentioned in there. He writes this psalm, but he's mentioned in there. He went through some, through some tough times. Daniel in the lion's den, mentioned. Being thrown into a pit of fire, that's mentioned. All of these people who found rest in God and went the distance. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the cloud of witnesses being the people in chapter 11, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. This next verse, with emphasis, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Christ, our shepherd. We're called to do one thing. One thing. Fix our eyes on Christ. Throw everything else away. Every distraction that might m make you miss that the floor is already clean. Every area of your life that you're trying to find significance in outside of Christ, throw it away. We're called to do one thing. Fix our eyes on the shepherd. Persevere after the shepherd being Christ. And the peace of God, which transcends all all understanding will follow. The put-together Christian life that we, that we so eager to create for ourselves will follow. The results that we so eager want to see in our own life, if we're struggling with a certain sin struggle and we, we just can't seem to conquer it, money situations, loved ones, everything, we throw it to the side to pursue Christ and everything else that matters, Christ will provide when you need it, where you need it, and with whom you need it. So the challenge is, are we going to accept that? Are the promises of the word of God going to be enough for you? As we continue on in the summer, as we continue on in our lives, is knowing that God is with us, with you, with me, is that going to be enough? Are you willing to lay down your own life so that Christ might lead you? And so that you can continue to get to know him on a deeper and deeper level, becoming more and more used to his presence, more and more used to his peace, and more and more used to his voice, so that during those times of trouble and in the future, you're going to know that everything is going to be okay. I shared with you three different promises, three of my favorite promises in the Word of God. And I can assure you of this, there are so, so, so many 
more in the Bible. And if you're sitting here today and you have yet to find that relationship with Christ, and you're thinking to yourself, Justin, you're crazy, man. I have no idea what you're talking about, this resting in the relationship. I've never once seen Christ as my shepherd. And there's no way I want to be a sheep. I would challenge you and encourage you with an open mind and an open heart to approach the word of God. This is his love letter to us, to you. Don't miss out on this. Don't miss out on this. The God of the universe, the God of the universe wants to get to know you. He has a future for you. He has promises for you, but to start off, like with any relationship, it's a two-way road. He came down to us. All we have to do is persevere after him and look to him and put our trust in him. Would you pray with me? God, I just want to thank you so much for the promises that we see in your word, for the hope that we see from your word, and for allowing us to become sheep because you are a shepherd. God, as we approach this holiday, recognizing the freedom that we have here in this country, I would pray that you remind us of the freedom that we have in you, the freedom to rest, and the relationship that we can find only in you. God, I pray that you would just make that peace so real in our lives, that you would make your presence so real in our lives, and that when we approach our concrete floors, we wouldn't miss that it's already been cleaned. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.